Welcome to Fuller Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller here with Josh Green, the founder and president of Pangeva. Co-founder. Okay. Yep. So you you co-founded the business back in when did you guys start? 2006. And and you sold recently sold the business to S and P. That's right. So you're a founder that's gone through the journey of cold starting a business, raising venture capital, and you raised it in 2008. 2008. That's right. So the wrong time to raise it, right time. I mean. A spectacularly lucky time to yeah, raise it. Right, March of 08, uh, just uh, just a few months before the crash. It, it's interesting to sort of think about what's happening in venture now. Uh, there's a lot of capital out there. Yep. You don't actually have to have a found like a sound business. But back in those days, the world was different. Yeah, and and because you couldn't follow on that capital when the financial markets collapsed, do you think that helped you? focus on bootstrapping the business. You had venture, but focused on unit economics? For sure. I mean, the, 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 the key conversation that followed the crash uh, was with an investor who said to me, point blank, you will never, ever be able to raise more money. So you either figure out how to build a real business or you're going out of business. And I took that seriously. And I, you know, to, to give ourselves credit, I think a lot of companies, a lot of founders heard that speech from their investors during the Great Recession. We took it seriously, and I think we're fortunate because we had something that could be a real business. Uh, but that was, to me, that was the beginning of, of um, the journey that, uh, that resulted in success, which was us focusing not on growth at all costs, but on building something that our customers really valued and would pay for. Is this go back to Sequoia, the, the old yeah. legendary deck yeah, of, was, uh, was that, was that? Yeah, uh, but I got the short that? version of it. Okay. I, got, I got, you're never going to be able to raise more money. And this was late 2008 after the market and Lehman sort of collapsed. And that's stuff. right. That's right. But, you know, I think back on it and I think the path we were on before that wasn't a sustainable path. You know, we were building something that we thought was cool. We didn't really have to talk to customers because we had cash in the bank and didn't need revenue. But things changed quickly, and we needed to talk to our customers. We needed to understand what they would pay for, what they wouldn't pay for, and uh, that put us on a path to building a real business. You got religion, they say. That's right. So, so when you started the business, you went out and raised some capital. Yeah. Your first round, did you guys were you generating? Did you have customers, or is this sort of a foundational no. idea? No, I think that's a real change. I mean, if you go back in time, we um, when we first raised angel money, we uh, we really had a business plan. And that's it. We had some mock-ups, uh, but there was nothing in the way of product or customers. Uh, shortly after we raised Angel, we started building a prototype, uh, which I think was nice in illustrating what we were trying to do, but wasn't actually creating any real value. We did have a customer who took the plunge and, uh, and wrote us our first check, which was great because we could put it on the wall. but. Realistically, we weren't creating a lot of value for that first customer. Uh, and um, it was a different time because I think now, you know, before investors write checks, they want to see real traction because it's so cheap to build and deploy a product. If you can't get traction now before you raise money, people think, ah, you know, maybe there's no there there. Back in the day, we needed money to build the product. Right. Uh, so, um, so fortunately, you know, we had investors who saw the vision. Uh, after we raised the, the venture round, that's when we built a product that really worked and was creating value for folks. Uh, and um, you know, I think, again, I think we were fortunate that we were steered towards the direction of doing something that was, frankly, more straightforward than the original vision. Because the original vision was building a marketplace, using data to bring people in, but then getting them to transact with each other. You know, we had this grand vision of this thing we were gonna build, but ultimately, you know, when we were forced to be more disciplined, we had to take a hard look at what we were good at and what our customers wanted and, and where the intersection was. And it was data. Mm -hmm. Now, this was before data was cool. And I'm not sure data's cool, but this was before. I would argue it's cool. It's, uh, which suggests maybe you and I aren't <laughs> so cool. Right, right. We're, we're, well, my wife tells me I'm not. My yeah. kids remind me that. So. But, uh, but no, th this was you know, well before people were talking about big data and machine mm -hmm. learning. AI, uh, but it, it was the thing we were good at. Mm -hmm. And it was the thing our customers were saying, yes, that's what I'm coming to you for. I'm not coming to you to find a new uh, platform to transact on, I'm coming to you for data. Yeah. So once we you know, really were self-aware about that and focused on that, 
yeah, we were on the road to building a better business. So you started out wanting to be a marketplace. Yep. Is a procurement, supply chain, yep. uh, order goods. Um, I mean, that was a hot concept in the totally. mid-2000s, and then totally. those marketplaces were difficult. It's interesting because uh, Freightways actually, when we first started, our first concept was to create a futures market in trucking. Okay. Um, and we found, much like you, is that data was actually what people really sort of wanted, yep. more, much more so than transacting. Yep. Um, but that's that's how we got our start. It was very similar. I'm, I'm curious. So you guys, you, you raise your capital, you're, you're running out with data, and then you became the market go-to for, for this, this very specialized data. Yep. That, uh, what was that journey like? So the, the journey was um, was interesting, I think, in that, you know, certainly we evolved, but I think the market evolved around us as well. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I always talk about the, the experience we first had when we would talk to uh, sourcing executives, the folks who were uh, figuring out where to buy product from around the world. You know, they were our first customers and we were going in and we were saying, hey, we've got all this data you can use to figure out which supplier you want to uh, do business with. And the response we'd get is data. We don't, we don't need data. I got an army of people. They'll figure out who we're going to do business with. Cut to a decade later, everybody knows they need to use data mm -hmm. uh, as at least part of what they're doing. Now, you know, the level of sophistication that people have in terms of working with data varies widely right now. But that's a real market change. So in the early days, it wasn't so much around you know, us trying to get to the head of the pack of people who were providing data. It was us trying to help the market understand how they could use data and that they could use data. Mm -hmm. That was really the early part of our journey. Um, later on, it, you know, it was more uh, uh, about prioritization. I would say that was the big challenge. Again, not, not so much competition as how do, we, how do we focus our energies? We're a small business. We, uh, we need to um, be thoughtful about our resources because we're not going to go out and raise big money. Uh, so how do we think about prioritizing customer segments to go after? How do we think about which use cases we want to enable using our data? Um, Pangeva, I think it's it, one of the things that was always fun about the company and still is, is that it catches people's imagination when people start understanding the data, they start thinking, oh, I could do this with it. I could do that with it. They have all kinds of ideas. And we had all kinds of ideas, but you have to prioritize. Mm -hmm. And that uh, was um, a challenge that was a recurring challenge over the life of the company. Yeah, I mean, Pangeva is the go-to source for really customs import data, supply chain information. Yeah. How, how else do customers use it? So if you, well, you know, let me, let me start uh, let me go back and, and, and talk about the basics of, of what it is we're doing. So you mentioned customs data. That's a key source for us. What we're doing is we're, we're collecting information about transactions, transactions where somebody sold something to somebody else in a different country. So it's cross-border transactions, and uh, we're collecting uh, now over 2 billion of these records. And you know, it's really cool. Each record tells you company A sent product B to company C. And it tells you when, and it tells you how much it weighed. Like, there's a lot of really cool data in there. The challenge, of course, is that no mortal can go through two billion records in search of insight. It's just not possible. Mm -hmm. So the thing that we had to get good at was taking those two billion pieces, and you know, I think of it as a jigsaw puzzle, putting it together to tell the stories of the companies that are involved in global trade. So we profile about 8 million companies around the world that are either buying product internationally or selling product to somebody in another country or moving product. So we're, we're keeping tabs on those companies. And uh, all told, it's about 40% of global trade that we're covering. And the, the early use case was, as I mentioned, going to, to folks who were finding suppliers and saying, hey, use this data to build a shortlist, right? You wanna uh, buy patio furniture from Vietnam? We'll tell you the companies that are uh, doing the most uh, manufacturing of patio furniture in Vietnam. And we'll tell you who they've done business with in the past, which gives you some sense of credibility. So that's what we did. And that's frankly all we did for several years. But over time, 
people kept coming to us and saying, well, there's other stuff we think we could do with the data. And the, the next segment that we um, focused on was factories. So we had been telling buyers, retailers, who to buy product from. The factories were saying, well, maybe we could use your data to figure out who we can sell to. And the answer was, yes, yes, they could. Then logistics companies came to us and said, you know, we uh, want to get you know, we want to grow our market share in this particular trade lane. Can you tell us who's buying and selling in that trade lane? The answer was yes, we can. Uh, and then uh, over time, you know, there were more and more uh, uh, folks doing more and more specific things with it. Um, but most recently, investors. Yeah, financial markets are, I mean, FactSet has some of the same data. That's right. Peers is also, Peers is mostly logistics providers that are in the space, or are they yeah, I think also that's selling right. in that? I think that's right. And, and you gotta give Peers credit because Peers, Peers is the, the first company that was ever collecting and publishing this type of data. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, I, I always like to give them credit for being the, the founders of the feast. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a space that's all of a sudden become a lot of interest. These financial companies, I mean, I just bought JOC and Peers data uh, FactSet is is uh, has has assembled this data. You're a part of S and P. Yep. It's because of financial markets. This data has relevance for those guys, I imagine. Yeah, that's right. And and I think, you know, to me, as I as I thought about um, S and P Global as a as an acquirer, I think part of what was so appealing was a, a sense that we were joining an organization that that thought similarly about the challenges of working with data. You know, from our perspective, you know, we saw tremendous potential in data, uh, but we also knew that it's hard. It's hard to actually get value from data. But you look at financial markets, and you know, arguably, this is you know, this is the place where people first started getting value from data. Without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, S and P Global it traces its heritage back to Henry Varnum Poor collecting data on railroads. Yeah. Right. So, you know. The, the, the tradition of leveraging data to get insight is there in, in the world of finance. S&P Global, I think, you know, broadly speaking, recognizes, I think, that there, there are twin challenges today. In some cases, there isn't data uh, about things that people are interested in. I think until we started organizing data about uh, global trade in a way that was usable, yeah, I guess the raw material was there, but we weren't really, uh, people weren't really able to kind of harness the, the data uh, for useful ends. That's, that's the kind of not enough data or not enough insight problem. But now there's this twin problem, which is too much data. Right? You talk to organizations that are drowning in data mm -hmm. now. You know, I remember one of our customers, I, I told him, you know, we thought of ourselves as a data company. He said, well, that's a terrible way to describe yourself because you're selling something that I have too much of. And I think a lot of people feel that way now. So in some cases, you have not enough data. In some cases, you have too much data. But I think the, the punchline is it's hard to get value from data. And I think we saw that as kind of the root problem we were trying to solve. And I think in S&P Global, we found a company that, that looked at the world in the same way. You know, it's interesting uh, having be in the intersection of, of freight data, supply chain data, and financial markets. because. A lot of our board and investors have both have been in the financial markets. Yep. One of the things that I learned very early on was talking to an executive. He was a former executive at Thomson Reuters. He said, "Craig, there are so many people that have data out there that approach us all the time. Yep. It's it's how do you make the data actionable? That's, right. that's really the secret sauce. It's not that you have data. And I talked to a lot of companies in freight that have data that want to sell it and think that they can and are not, frankly not good at it. Yeah. They just don't know what to do with it. They don't know how to make it a digest or actionable. And I think those are the sort of the intersection points of the, 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 that create opportunity, but also create a lot of noise out there. So I have a theory about this, which is that uh, we have, um, we've gone through a, a pretty significant change in terms of the availability of data. Uh, in, in our lifetimes, where it used to be that data was so scarce, right? If you got your hands on a data set, it was kind of an unusual thing. You should squeeze as much out of it as you possibly could. And so the incentives were all oriented towards spending as much time as you could getting insight from a data set. Now there's kind of a different dynamic where there's so many different data sets out there 
there's actually a real cost if you spend too much time with mm -hmm. one data set. It's opportunity cost. Right. Right? You're not spending time with <clears throat> another data set where there might be more valuable insight. So for me, any time I encounter, whether it's an entrepreneur or you know, the customers that we work with, any time I encounter them and they say, you know, there's this data and we're trying to figure out what to do with it, that to me is a, is a red flag. I, I, I think that is uh, an approach that is almost always going to lead to failure. I think far better to start with a business decision that you're trying to inform and work backwards to say, what type of insight might help me make that decision? And then backwards from there to say, and what data might help me get to that insight? There's so much data available today, chances are pretty good you're going to be able to find data that can help you answer that question. Do, do you think that's true predominantly in the financial markets where, I mean, they're flooded with data because yep. that's where the money's at, right? Yep. That's people chasing money. But in non-financial uh, markets, it strikes me, at least what we see in transportation, is that this is, we're just recently come in with transparency. There's just data that's never been available before that all of a sudden is. We're seeing it different, like yep. where, where there isn't sort of a, a people aren't awash with it they have their own data, and they have a lot of confirmation bias about their data, but they've only recently had access to data they've never had available. And I'm wondering, what are you, you've seen evolution of markets. Yep. How, do, how do you think of that? That's interesting. Uh, so it, it, it resonates, I think, with our experience. I mean, you certainly, I think, both across industries and, I mean, frankly, even within industries across companies, you see people at very different uh, places in, or very different spots in the journey of, of getting value from data. Um, but I think kind of regardless of where you are, I just, the, the bias that I have, the belief that I have is that you really need to work backwards from the business decision that you're trying to make. I just think it is, it is the one sure way to, to ensure that you either get value or quickly move on mm -hmm. to something more productive. I just, the, the notion of taking a data set and hoping that there's something valuable you can find in it, that to me is the thing that it I It gives you difficult, yeah. A lot of, and you've seen a lot of people try that. Totally. Probably not only customers that have adopted your data set, but also a lot of competitive products that are out there. That's right. And competitive noise. I, I'm curious, you, you, you're a founder, you raised a little bit of venture capital. You, uh, from that point on, you went out and built the business the old fashioned way with revenues. Yep. And you ended up selling it to S&P. What's that like? Yeah, there was a, I think a, a, a feeling that we were, we were joining an organization that viewed the world similarly. So in that sense, uh, things came together nicely. But even though we're seeing the world similarly, 53 people is very different than 20,000 people. And, and it's actually, for me, been, just personally speaking, it's been one of the things I've been most interested to, uh, to learn about, right? What's, what's the same and, and what's different? And, you know, from, from my perspective so far, and it's only, you know, it's only been a year and a half, but my perspective so far is that um, leadership is leadership, right? Communicating a vision matters, whether you're 53 people or 20,000 people. Uh, relationships matter. Uh, the, um, you know, being thoughtful about how you prioritize matters, right? So I think there are similarities. To me, the big, big difference is, uh, and obviously I'm not the first person to put my finger on this, but the big, big difference is just how hard it is to turn the ship. And you know, my, I have a bias, which is you know, when I see a problem, I want to solve it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in a big organization, if you do that, you could spend the rest of your career trying <laughs> to solve that problem. Right. right. So just be thoughtful about it and make sure that what you're biting off is really what you want to chew. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're finding a lot of corporate inertia and friction yeah. and structures and some of them were set up for a lot of really good reasons totally. some of them are set up just because they are and nobody knows why they exist they yeah. just do um, I mean how do you think about as a, as a founder um, is this do you think you'll be at S&P for the next 20 years or, or is at some point uh, something interesting is gonna come up and you're gonna do something else yeah, I have no idea how to answer that question. Um, I, what I will say is, I, uh, as somebody who has, you know, I spent a long time, I mean, since I was a kid, thinking about the long-term future. Mm -hmm. right? In fact, when we, we put pen to paper uh, to, to write down the values that we wanted to have guide Panjiva, one of them was that we were building an institution for the long-term. 
we wanted to take the long-term view when making decisions. So thinking ahead is my thing. Yeah. I love it. Uh, but candidly, after a, a dozen years of building a company and uh, not sleeping <laughs> much of those 12 years, I, I decided that what I really wanted to do was live in the moment for a little while. I, I can't so. blame you. I mean, it is running a company and dealing with all sorts of issues and, and not having that safety net, not at, like, I mean, literally, if, if you know, whatever it is could destroy what you've built, then that's, that's, that's stressful. That's right. And I, and I think in bigger companies, there's a lot of resources that you've never had available with a, you know, a brand that is world class and is well known and well regarded. Um, I'm, a lot of stuff happening in trade. Pangeva uh, certainly sees a lot of the activity uh, around global trade. What's happening? What, what is your perspective on what's happening around trade? Well, you know, we talked earlier about how data uh, wasn't cool. Mm -hmm. uh, in the early days of Pangeva, and then all of a sudden data was cool. Trade was kind of the same way, mm -hmm. right? When I would tell people I was involved in trade, like people would go back to, I think George Costanza from Seinfeld and say, oh, import, export. Yeah. Right, right. But <laughs> it, trade you was- You were not the cool guy. Not the cool guy at the party, cool. no. Yeah. Uh, but, but trade, I mean, trade was boring, Yeah. right? And the last two years, trade has not been boring. No, right? it's been top of the stack. Yeah, for, for sure. sure. Um, you know, I, uh, I have lots of perspectives on kind of the dynamics uh, around trade from a political perspective. But in terms of what we're seeing in the data, you know, the key thing that, that is blindingly obvious is that um, trade is a little bit like a balloon, right? You squeeze it here, you see the air go somewhere else. So one of the statistics I was reading in, in today's Pangeva Daily is that um, electronic shipments from China uh, to the US are down 58% over the last 12 months. But from the rest of the world to the US, they're up 66%, yeah. right? So you squeeze one area, you send the air somewhere I mean, there's still else. been net growth. I mean, you can't, yeah. I mean, trade is, you can't, it, ultimately the market finds a way. Right, that's and, right. And, and, that's right. and, and so all sorts of stuff. Um, it, what, what's next in terms of your business and Panjeev as a product? Any new product iterations you guys are, are thinking about? Or? So for us right now, I think that the key thing we're focused on is, is getting uh, our data into the hands of S&P Global's customer base. Uh, and you know, it's one of the great things about being part of a large organization. We were 53 people. Uh, not all those people were salespeople, yeah. right? So our sales team was small. S&P Globals is big, yeah. and, and more to the point, the customer relationships that are already mm -hmm. in place are extraordinary. Right. Uh, and so now getting our data into their hands is, is the top priority. Now in the background, we've got some stuff going on on the product development front, uh, but I've learned my lesson not to get, get ahead of my skis on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, distribution's key in any technology business. I think that's, that's right. always, as founders, the part that's you put that, let's get the product right, and then you forget, oh, we have to sell it, and, and that's always difficult. So I heard, I heard uh, or maybe I read somebody uh, saying that first-time founders always focus on product. Yeah. Second-time <laughs> founders always focus on distribution. Well, that, it's interesting. I have not heard that, yeah. but that, that is exactly, so I, I had started the company, and it was five years in. We, had, we were doing bank services, and we had from 2005 to 2010, we had two banks live. And then we found, the Amer we did a deal with a, a bank association. And we had 400 within four years. And that was my realization that distribution matters. Yeah. And I had not figured that out. Yeah, yeah. This time was the opposite. Yeah, yeah. I went out and said, well, let's, let's secure distribution. Product yeah. iteration is fairly easy once right. you have, once you have a community to sell it to, you can actually create something. And right. that was sort of, I, I like that quote. I'd love to find the original source. But yeah. uh, well, really appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Uh, it's been great. Uh, good luck on, everything that you're doing and congratulations on your success and we'll, we'll hope to, to you as well yeah, thank you uh, we hope to read about it uh, more Everyone knows Chicago is the freight capital of the entire world. I don't know why you think Chattanooga is. It's not. Why are we even having a debate about this? Let's put this to bed. Chicago versus Chattanooga. Everyone knows it's Chicago. That's the birthplace of the logistics industry. You're going down, Craig. 